Our next speaker is Joan Trumpar Mulholland, one of the sit-inners at the Sheridale Drug Fair 58 years ago today. Joan's resume makes her part of this country's civil rights aristocracy. She's not only a veteran of the 1960 Arlington Lunch Counter sit-ins, but also the protests that same summer at Glen Echo Amusement Park. In 1961, she joined the Freedom Riders, was arrested in Mississippi, and was imprisoned there for two months. In May 1963, she participated in the lunch counter sit-in at the Woolworths in Jackson, Mississippi. There are some photographs on the sales material up on the balcony that uh, shows that uh, sit-in, and uh, it'll curl your hair when you see it. That August, she was among those helping organize the March on Washington. A month later, she attended the funeral in Birmingham, Alabama, of four little black girls who died in a bomb blast at their church. Joan participated in the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965 and the Memphis to Jackson March in 1966. After a career as a teaching assistant in Arlington's public schools and having raised five children, she speaks on civil rights issues throughout the United States and around the world. Please join me in welcoming Joan trump How many minutes? No, I knew about it. We don't want to know. Well, we this is going. quite the crowd. And I don't think I got a whole lot to add to what's been said, but I'll try and um, likewise I can talk forever. <laughs> so what brought me to Cherrydale? Well, I'm a lifelong Arlingtonian. You ask how long I've been in Arlington? You ask in my age. <laughs> and I haven't gone far in life. I've gone eight tenths of a mile down the road, North Glebe Road to South, uh, not Glebe, George Mason to South George Mason and one block west. So I'm at home. Um, I think one of the influences on me was the community in Buckingham. It was known as the only place in Arlington that would rent to Jewish families. And you had all these folks who had come uh, during the Depression to get those good government jobs. You know, down from New York, for instance, supporting Roosevelt. And now they were moving out, getting families and moving out of those boarding houses. And they could move to Buckingham. So about 80% of my playmates were from liberal New York Jewish families. And though they weren't trying to convert us, I think it was an influence, you know, subtle in the background. And beyond that, they were helpful. They would hide those Christians' Christmas presents in the top of the closets and swear their kids to secrecy about where their Christmas presents were, that Santa Claus was not bringing them. Yeah. So... This sort of was a mindset, and I ended up at Duke University. Not that I wanted to go there, but Mother insisted. <laughs> you know, I wanted to go to Muskingum College in Ohio, small church school. No. Well, it was good enough for John Glenn. Why wasn't it good enough for me, you know? <laughs> but I had to go to some prestige school. Mother was all about that and, you know, safely segregated in North Carolina. So I went to do, you know, get me away from mother anyway. <laughs> and that is when the sit-in started. Well, we had a, I went to the Presbyterian Youth Group Sunday evenings, and one week we were told that some of the students from North Carolina College, the black school, that were leading, that were having the sit-ins and the pickets down in Durham, downtown, would be coming out to speak with us about it, but keep it quiet. You didn't want the administration to lock you out. You didn't want um, the rowdies or the police, with all due respect, to show up. And um, so we had a well-dressed, well-spoken students came and talked to us about the sit-ins. And then shock and law, you know, shock and awe, they invited us to join them. So a bunch of us did and the administration at Duke went ballistic. Well, I did finish out my semester and get my credit hours. 
but then I was, Duke and I had a split company. And I, but the students at North Carolina College said this back, you know, for you younger folks before the internet, before even long distance phone calls were common. Mm -hmm. We haven't heard anything from those Howard students since the big SNCC Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I got the t-shirt. Uh, um, when you get up to D.C., go up to Howard and find out what's happening and write us, you know, a letter, cursive, all that, <laughs> postage stamp. And um, if they're not doing anything, help them get going. Well, I w followed my directions. Did I know where Howard was? I was from Arlington. <laughs> no, but I found my way and wandered around like a lost puppy on campus asking if anybody knew anybody who was involved in sit-ins or anything. Well, believe it, I think it was that evening the students were planning a meeting to discuss sitting in in Arlington. Dion is here. Ethelina was here. Stand up, you two. They, they, they were part of this nonsense. <laughs> well, You're making they, me blush. <laughs> they welcomed me to the group. I had experience with sit-ins and going to jail, and I was from Arlington where they were planning to sit in. So yeah, I was welcome. Even this, you know, this white girl from Virginia could join them. So I did. We started off down the road at what was then called Peoples. Mm -hmm. And things were pretty calm. About 13 of us were there, and, and you know, nothing was happening. We were just sitting. So a bunch of us trekked up the road to drug fair and sat in. Now, drug fair was pretty much, in my mind, a local chain that started in Arlington, sort of where the clo now closed Buckingham Florist was located and then it expanded and moved over to where the CVS now is. Um, but I felt right at home with it. Um, the, the guy who founded it, we were, he and my daddy were on first name basis. So I, I was at home with drug fare and we sat in. And th this did not stay so calm. It was a little bit too close to the school, and the kids from Stratford wanted to come up and get their Coca-Cola and things, you know, except they couldn't. Nor could the students from W&L. And they came on up, and I understand they were encouraged by some folks distributing Nazi pimp, you know, flyers down at the school and tell them, oh, things are happening up, up at the drug fair. Get on up there. Well, they did. And heckled us, and the women they left alone with the guys, they sort of pushed around, and I think some cigarettes and things. <laughs> but um, then George Lincoln Rockwell and his stormtroopers showed up. Well, I, I, that, that, that perturbed me, because when we had moved over to North Arlington, Rockwell had the house that was just down the street on Williamsburg Boulevard. And those big old dogs that looked like they were coming through the plate glass window. We walked, kids were walking up um, to Nottingham or Williamsburg where I attended or even church. We walked on the other side of the street where there was no sidewalk rather than walk on the sidewalk in front of that house with those big dogs up in the window. So I felt uncomfortable to put it mildly with the Nazis, but they showed up. Now Dion, he thought, oh my God, we know what they believe in, and if they're as devout as we are, you know, as, as grounded in things, th th this could go down bad. But the police were around. The police and the county board and all, they were, basically in favor of integration, or had no problem with it. They weren't making arrests, and if, if things became integrated, okay. But there was this little matter of a state law. 
Now, <laughs> folks will tell you, oh, Northern Virginia, that's not part of the South. Well, let me tell you, the state law was the state law, that public assembly law for segregated, about segregated seating, that applied in Arlington, too. And for not, did it just say the people that sat together and ate or prayed or rode the buses or what have you, not only they could be arrested for integrating, but the person who enabled them, like the store manager, could be arrested too. And I reckon those store managers weren't going to serve us because they weren't ready to go to jail that day. I, I, I suspect that had as much to do with it as anything. But, and Northern Virginia is not part of the South. I tell folks, well, Robert E. Lee is my homeboy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Northern Virginia was the South. And we knew it. We were in the South, and we were going against local custom and law. But we sat there, and the police sort of gave us some protection, um, or at least, you know, ran some of the rowdies out, finally told Rockwell to get, get himself out. But having guys with signs saying, is we is or is we ain't equals, you know, and things like that, marching behind us, being counter-picketed, as it were, and those swastikas on their armbands, that that was not comfortable. But we were nonviolent. We sat there, ignored them. What did you talk about? Oh, we talked about school. We had our Bibles. If school was in session, which I think it still might have been, we had our textbooks, because, you, you know, you were still responsible for your lessons. And finally, the store closed, and the police gave a safe passage outside where the sidewalk was packed with folks. Now, some folks were friendly to us in the store and out, but there was a good many who were not. Um, and cars were brought up and took us on out. And Within a couple weeks, we'd had a little peacekeeping deal, a little, a little break, so the store managers and the um, county officials could talk, and then we sat in again down at Sherlington. And um, next thing you know, the next day, we're getting served. I guess the word had gone down that nobody was going to get arrested that the law was not going to be enforced. Now, I think that on the part of the county prosecutors was pretty much, you know, discretionary enforcement of the law. I don't know if that was quite legal on their part, but they just said, we aren't going to enforce it. So, at which point the store manager said, well, then we're going to serve folks. And Woolworths was the first whether because they made the decision first, I don't know, but or because that was the next place we sat in. I think that may have had as much to do with it as anything. And then drug fair, albeit the one in Buckingham, was the next place to, where folks were served. And then Fairfax, which had said they would arrest, and Alexandria, they said, well, if Arlington's not arresting, we aren't either. <coughs> And on to the next challenge. I think that was the movie theaters. But oh, and then NAG. This is this group at Howard. They called themselves NAG, the Nonviolent Action Group. They were going to NAG the country. Yeah. <laughs> what are we going to do next? Oh, let's go to the beaches. Did you know beaches? The, the Atlantic Ocean. It's all segregated, don't you know? And um, then reality set in. That that's a little bit too much of a commute to go over to the beaches. So we, we, we picked on Glen Echo, and the swimming pool was the big issue there. And you had to have a ticket for each ride. Of course, I could buy the tickets, not a problem. I went in and bought tickets, and came back out and handed them out to the folks <laughs> who went and got on the merry-go-round and got themselves arrested sitting on the merry-go-round. Yeah. And the beat goes on. We went on the Freedom Rides. And for you, we got some young folks here. The message is... We started with the sit-ins, 
the kids who were doing the sit-ins kept the freedom riots going. We moved into community organization, morphed into voter registration, led to the Edmund Pettus Bridge, led to President Johnson saying we have to have a Voting Rights Act, and it led to the elect election of President Obama and other black officials. Okay. Doug Wilder, he, had, man, he was the first elected black governor in the history of the United States, right here in Robert E. Lee's state. Yeah, so pretty good. Yeah. So you young folks that are here, you start something. It's your turn now. Start doing something and move the revolution forward. Thank you. Thank you.